Just as the pandemic was starting, Daniel Thorson went into a 75-day silent retreat at the Monastic Academy in Vermont. He came out into a post-COVID world and straight into the New York Times, interviews around the globe, and became a viral TikTok hit in China. But there's an even more interesting story behind it, because for years before the pandemic exposed how fragile our systems were, Daniel was exploring exactly these questions of existential risk through the Emerge podcast. So I wanted to see what he was making of the experience. You read the New York Times article um, about me. I then was subsequently contacted by like uh, probably like a dozen or more different news agencies around the world. Like I did a radio interview in Australia and in in London and Ireland, and um, and then I, definitely the the, the the most, I guess the, the main feeling I feel is amusement right now. Um, it's very surreal to come off of a silent, a 75 day silent retreat and be like thrust into the blue church media machine and kind of just digested and taken for a ride. Um, so yeah, it's, it's surreal. Yeah. It's just the juxtaposition. It's like you deliberately did absolutely nothing or very little for 75 days. And that's become incredibly newsworthy for everyone. Yeah. yeah, that's the strangest thing is that that would be at all newsworthy. But I think it actually, it reflects the, how sort of um, significant people think that the last two months were that they want to see a reflection of themselves in me who didn't participate in it. And so it's funny because people are asking me like, well, what was it like? What's it like for you? But really, I, I think they really want me to ask them what it was like for them. Hmm. You know, cause I, I didn't like, you know, I didn't go through it and I'm almost having to read a history of it. Yeah. There's been these videos that have gone pretty viral of people sort of talking to their pre-lockdown selves. Mm. Like, how would it be if you talk? Oh, I saw one of them. So in a way you are, I think that's really insightful. You are kind of the pre-lockdown self. (laughs) Although I was under lockdown, you know, it was voluntary, but I was under lockdown. I just didn't have all the social media feeds and the news and the information coming at me. But I knew I, you know, the other thing is that I think I posted an ironic tweet and, and, it was, uh, I'm back from 75 days in silence. Did I miss anything? And of course, like, I knew that there was a pandemic, right? So if, <laughs> obviously, I, I obviously knew. And you can actually look like three more tweets down in my timeline to see me asking about the impact, the known impacts of COVID on people in certain age ranges and how to protect against it as a community. So there are now news agents. And so this has been really interesting to see how, things get distorted by the news media, right? So they're then portraying me as if I'm this, like, I had no clue that this was happening. That I was just completely in the dark, which is so clearly not true. And you would just have to do an iota of research to find that out. Um, yeah. Yeah. But the, that's why I find the whole thing so astonishing and is because... And I don't think the New York Times article got there and probably none of the other news pieces got there either is because you'd been going into existential risk. You've been doing a real deep dive into exactly all of these topics that are now front and center of everyone's mind, which is what I find astonishing about this whole situation is you've come out. And also the fact that we talked about kind of you feeling that you've come to the end of that exploration. You were sort of like, okay, I'm not sure where I go next with this. Yeah, like that deeper level of, on some level, you'd you'd gone as deeply as anyone, I think, into understanding the, the sort of how how badly wrong our source code had gone and how fragile our society was. I mean, that's what I I'm really interested in. Was there a sense of recognition when you came out, like, huh, this is what I was maybe picking up towards the end of the exploration with the podcast. Uh, recognition. Yeah, it's something like, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised. And I, 
I don't want to say I felt vindicated, but I felt like uh, more confident in the decisions I made about how I'm living my life. Because right? I have I have intentionally chosen to live in a way uh, that I think takes into account, as you say, the kind of buggy source code of our planetary system. And so because I live in that way, this actually, the, the whole pandemic, um, whether or not I was in solitary retreat, wouldn't have been as massive an impact because I live in community. You know, we cook for each other. We entertain each other. We um, uh, cut each other's hair, you know. And so I wouldn't have been isolated in the way that so many folks were. And furthermore, I wouldn't have, I mean, I wouldn't have lost my job. All these things would have been sort of, um, I've already lost my job. I've already lost my life. I've already walked down the hill of collapse to a large degree. My life is incredibly simple. And so, you know, as people begin to grieve the loss of the world they thought they could depend on, I've done that. I've been doing that for years. And um, so like, uh, I, I, I feel kind of business as usual. It's amazing too to watch the planet go through this and to, to be here for it, but it's not surprising. And what, when you say the planet go through this, what is your frame? Yeah, my model is just that there's uh, a phase shift, uh, um, uh, systems collapse, a movement into a time between worlds, as Zach Stein puts it, and that there's now an acceleration of that, seemingly, um, uh, due to the pandemic and second and third order effects from that, and then those weaving back into the complicated complex system. So, I, I mean, so that's what it is. It's a, it's a dissolution. It's a dissolution. It's a revealing. As you say, it's an apocalypse. Um, and I think that can be quite beautiful or it can be horrible, depends on how we participate with it and whether we've been lying to ourselves up until this point. Or how much we've been lying to ourselves until this point, assuming yeah, that we, exactly. we've all been lying to ourselves to some degree. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, think, I think let's recap the word apocalypse because I think we talked about it before we started recording. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Jamie Wheel that delineated those three words apocalypse armageddon and can't remember the last one but it'll probably come to me and he talked about apocalypse being the unveiling and that feels very relevant in the context of the lockdown in the context of covid because it seems to be revealing all of the stress points of the cultures mm -hmm. and also individually in lockdown how good are your primary relationships how good are yeah. you spending time with yourself how how strong, how much trust do you have in your immediate environment? All of these factors, which I think are going to become more and more, like I think you probably share a similar sense that we're actually only at the beginning of this yeah. process rather than, yeah, it, whatever happens, this was a, a shock to a system that is now seemingly unraveling mm -hmm. moment by moment and is going to continue to do so. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so the way that I've lived in response to that is to try to extract myself as much as I can from the system so that as it gets shocked and unravels, I don't, um, it doesn't destroy me. Uh, I voluntarily destroy myself so that uh, it can't hurt me in the way that it could. You know, like I've been doing these radio interviews and, and it's so weird how they work. They're five or 10 minutes long and they, they just process you. You just kind of are like cattle. You're just being put through this information harvesting machine, a story harvesting machine. And um, some, of the, some of the people that do it are very good at making you feel comfortable. But I, I know that you really care because I know you. Um, and it feels 
And, and, but in going through that process with all these like news stories, I start to like lose track of who I am, or I start to lose track of my perspective because I know that I know that they want something in particular, like that New York times article. We talked about a lot of different stuff. We talked for over three hours. I talked for over three hours with Ellen, the journalist. And um, I knew before that process started, I knew during, I knew after there was a particular story that she had in mind. And it wasn't about why you would do a solitary retreat or what Maple is, what the Monastic Academy is and what it stands for, what I was trying to achieve. You know, it was a different kind of story um, that she wanted. And I appreciate being in a space where like, I can kind of just speak what's true for me instead of having to deal with what I, what I think that, you want me to say, mm. um, which I think is really common in our media, in the mainstream media sphere. Now I know. Yeah. And also there's the, the thing that the more that you tell the story, if you're telling it to like 10 different media outlets, you get to learn pretty quickly. What are the key bits that they want to hear? And then you start, totally. then you start delivering a story that hits those particular. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. You see, you, it's like fractal metaprogramming, right? It just it goes all the way down the stack so that I then become a tool of this kind of collective, uh, intelligence or whatever. It's very weird. And I, I, it's, I don't know how people like get famous. And then after they get actually famous, they're like, actually fame is not really what I thought it would be like having just a little bit of exposure now, like just a very, 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 very tiny amount, like being in the New York times and talking, it's not that it's not good. It's, it's not conducive to happiness. Mm. It's not satisfying. Is that because of that, um, that process that you were just talking about? Like effectively yourself, your story starts becoming externalized in some way. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 you you're starting totally. to, the more attention you're having on you, the more kind of representations of your story that are being produced, the more it starts to collapse mm -hmm. the experience that you've had into a exactly. narrative. And it's not your narrative. It's the narrative that the blue. That's right. No. That's right. Exactly. And it's fucked up. And so, yeah, it's, it's really messed up. Um, yeah. I think that's exactly well said. Yeah. Mm. Well said. I'd never really considered it like that, but just hearing your description of it really fits. Like yeah. in a way, wow, that, there's also this sort of sense of, you know, the, is it Native Americans who believe that if your photograph mm -hmm. was taken, a, bit, a part of your, your soul was captured. Yeah. There's something true in that as, a, as an analogy. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I sat my retreat um, for the exact same duration as my friend, same time as my friend Peter Park, who lives here at the monastery with me. A wonderful human being. And obviously he didn't have a New York Times article written about him. He hasn't had to deal with all this or had this opportunity, depending on how you look at it. Um, and I think he's happier. And I think that his retreat is more sacred, hmm. is maintaining its sacredness relative to, to me. Uh, there, it's being held sacrosanct. It's being protected in a way that mine now is out of my hands in a very confusing way, perhaps unlike anybody who's ever sat a silent retreat in the history of the planet. It occurs to me, you know, like, I don't know that anybody's ever come out of a silent retreat and then had a New York times or, or had an, a planetary information system, harvest their story for the entertainment of the populace. That's a fascinating idea. <laughs> you, might, you might have had the most newsworthy silent retreat that there have ever been. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. Well, which probably just shows how narcissistic everybody is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're right, that it's actually a reflection of ourselves that we're, we're looking for in you rather than interested in you and your experience. Yeah. Which it sounds if, if a lot of people have sort of, or if the, the interview so far haven't really asked how it was for you, they're not really interested in it for that. No, I, uh, what, what is I don't the story think that they want to tell you say you've had a few of these different interviews. What is the story that they want to tell? Yeah, they, I mean, so the, the, that I'm like Rip Van Winkle and I'm like emerging into this completely changed world and they want me to tell them how I see the change. They want me to tell them 
what's been surprising about how the world has changed. So they want to, they want me to acknowledge, I guess, what is, what they went through or what, what shifts have taken place. Um, probably in order to for further consolidate their vision of this being a really significant time in history, a really like monumental epic, like, you know, epic shifting event. It's my imagination, but I, I haven't, I haven't thought about it too deeply yet. And, and do they know that your entire work before now was effectively saying that there will be <laughs> an epochal world changing event collapse Unclear, <laughs> very unclear. So much of a better story. That's that's the paradox as well. Is that all of these people are like, oh wow, there's a really good story here, and they're pushing it into a, a narrative that they understand and they think their, yeah. their viewers want. But actually, the story itself is so much more interesting than that. <laughs> here's a here's a guy who's who's gone as deeply as anyone into understanding collapse and understanding some system dynamics, and kind of effectively came to the end of that inquiry saying <laughs> i'm not sure what happens next and i that's what i find extraordinary as well is that i was picking up something similar i remember we talked i think it was last year mm. at the emerge gathering and you were sort of feeling the end of that inquiry and i kind of i wasn't quite there but then i had a series of experiences certainly towards the beginning of this year where i felt something similar mm. i actually met with um, Eric Weinstein, who said almost yeah. exactly the same thing. He, he kind of was, was looking around and saying, I feel like the system has crystallized and it's effectively dead. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that feels right. Of, of the inquiry that Rebel Wisdom has been on since the beginning and the inquiry that you've been on, this sort of sense of what's new and emerging and sensing, actually, I'm not sure what it is. I mean, something else is going to happen. And then the pandemic and the, the sort of second and third order consequence are mm -hmm. like, okay, that was the thing that was, that was coming. Mm. 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 Do you feel like your inquiry has been revitalized by COVID and by world? Yes. Events? Yeah. Huh. Very much so. Like this is in a sort of cliche, these are the times that we've been waiting for kind of, kind of way. Yeah. And also yeah. Huh. feeling really like, I feel like, and maybe you feel the same with, with emerge. I feel like, the the films that we've put out over the last two or three years on rebel wisdom all of so much of what's happening now is in those films like i want to just go through the back catalog and grab yeah. out kind of all of these kind of amazing totally. thinkers effectively saying okay these are the deep forces that are at work the jordan yeah. halls the daniel schmachtenbergers the nora batons and say look we this was going something like this was going to happen and this is likely to only be the beginning of this process yeah. because there's something we've, we've done a series of events since the beginning of the pandemic about resilience and sense making yeah. and sense making is a form of resilience understanding yes. why something is happening being able yes. to understand okay what are the tectonic plates that are shifting yes. not being yes. overwhelmed by the by the impact of, yes. of what's going on is such a crucial thing yeah um, yeah and in, in the Rebel Wisdom community, in, in the, amongst our members, I remember the very first Zoom call that we had after, after the pandemic sort of really kicked mm. in. Most people on the call, not all, but most were actually saying, breathing a kind of sigh of relief. It's like, and yes, I, I know what's going on. I feel that mm. I was waiting for something like this. Wow. Huh. Huh. Yeah, I've actually heard the 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 sense of what you just said echoed by a lot of folks that I've spoken with since I've left retreat you know in our, that are in our kind of extended network um that they feel like w w yeah that w this is what we've been training for in a sense this is what we've been preparing for that we're kind of uh now is the time to show up in a way that we've been saying we we're going to need to show up in um, yeah. Yeah, I don't want it to get too self-congratulatory because I think there are things that we also need to do as a community yeah. to, to step. Right. I, I think Whoa. we... Uh, yeah. No, go on, go on. Yeah. I don't know, maybe that's another conversation, but I feel, I feel that just more generally, I, I don't think 
I don't think we have the the structures or the coherence to 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 respond as meaningfully as I think we should or as we need to. Yeah, and that that was actually my my sense when I heard people say this. It's just like, oh, interesting. So the echo chamber is still alive. Mm. And maybe even yeah. more more echoey. Um yeah. my my I mean, so what two things that come up for me. Um one is uh one of the impacts of I think both my retreat and coming to the end of this inquiry have been um, something that Zach Stein said in one of our last conversations. He said, you know, uh, game A, game B, that's all fine. But the real game is the people you spend time with. The real game is who you live with and how you treat them. Mm-hmm. And something about the end of this inquiry has just left me in that place where I'm just like, oh, great. So I've had all these philosophical conversations that have like seriously reordered my consciousness and my, the way I see things. How does that actually help me love the people I'm with? How does that actually help me move in the world in a way that I can be proud of? Actually, does it? And for me going forward, I think that really has to be the litmus test. Like I'm, I'm not willing to have conversations that are actually abstract to the point where they don't impact that directly. And, uh, and it, what's interesting is that I think those conversations actually can look quite abstract, the conversations that help us love, because so much of what keeps us, that prevents us from loving is the kind of philosophical, ontological, and epistemological systems that we naively participate in, like materialism and humanism and liberalism. And so it's so it's it's a funny position to be in because even as I've been on these radio shows, they introduce me often as a full, as an online philosopher, which is the worst, <laughs> the worst title I think that you could be, the, or the most easily characterized title I think you could be given. Um, easy, easily satirized. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and um, and uh, it, you know these conversations seem very philosophical, but I think they're actually more imminent than just about anything else we can talk about because they are the lens through which we view everything else we could talk about. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's one of the things that I'm most interested in is I think that just like there's an opportunity now to build kind of new social structures and new information, sense-making structures, there's also an opportunity to um, re-enchant the cosmos, to break out of materialism to break out of humanism and find ourselves again in a, in a world that's ensouled, that's meaningful and that calls us forth into a sense of divine duty. And that is um, necessary. I think if we're actually going to thread the eye of the needle in the years to come, I don't think it's not even, I don't think it's even worth doing it if we can't reawaken that or awaken that uh, sense of meaningfulness and of mm. sacredness. You documented that journey with the emerge podcast. You really, you, you, you made it a live exploration and, and recorded your, your exploration into a lot of these topics. Um, I guess one of the things is if people want to kind of retrace your steps, which, one, which particular conversations would you suggest they listen to? Um, yeah, probably I would recommend um, the three conversations, Jem Bendel, who wrote the deep adaptation paper, uh, Vinay Gupta, who, well, it's just Vinay Gupta. You have to listen to it. Um, and then saw you for all the most recent conversation that, that gives a kind of arc where I was, uh, reckoning finally completely with the basically becoming convinced, um, having c- attained convic- conviction about collapse and then, um, deciding to move back to maple, to accord with that conviction. And then the conversation with Soryu, I think places the uh, aspiration for awakening, uh, spiritual enlightenment in, in light of, and in terms of this, what time it is on the planet. Um, and so that I think gives a kind of nice nutshell of my, my recent journey. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I guess my, 
we actually recorded a conversation about collapse you you me and josh fields oh yeah and in that i think i for a long time i i've got sort of one foot in the jordan peterson camp in particular like we're in one of the best times to be alive we 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 shouldn't be um we have to be grateful for the miracle of civilization and holding that piece alongside a lot of the most um brilliant people i'm speaking to talking about self terminating systems and mm. being persuaded by that at the same time but not i never went into it as fully as you did or mm. maybe josh did and mm. like my my sense was holding all of these different pieces but at the beginning of the pandemic for me that possibility space really kind of collapsed down to okay mm. the systems thinkers and the the collapsologists i think they as you saw this start to cascade and you saw all the fragilities become clear for me it kind of closed mm. yeah all of these different possibilities it really started to close the space in terms of what's really going on and what mm. who, who who was sort of seeing um who had the most complete vision of what the kind of societal fragilities were so i'd say wow. that was part of my my journey with it was like oh actually now okay i i i feel like I feel like I held a lot of those different possibilities and now it's sort of become a little mm. bit more clear as to which one um was true and which one wasn't. And specifically it was the um systems theorists and the people who were really talking about systems fragility and collapse that you felt were more yeah right thinking. Yeah. Yeah, and and the also the the nature of a self-terminating system especially just looking at the bit that I'm primarily focused on which is the the sense making system and just mm. seeing how even that even oh, covid God. was then dragged into this sort of polarization spiral of how do we know what is true everything being weaponized from yeah. health advice to totally. kind of alternative narratives to just just realizing oh my god we have no way of determining what is true we're having all of these all of these factors that we kind of were aware of the sort of how sticky something is how much it's sort of reliant on outrage and limbic mm. hijack and all of mm. those kind of the the ecosystem of social media and and then realizing wow even even covid mm. is now becoming a culture war issue totally that yeah. that for me is is oh my god was was something i didn't i didn't expect because that didn't really happen in the uk so much the uk mm. generally the center has held to some to a much greater degree than it has in the states and mm. in europe i'd say to to a degree mm. um mm. you can argue that that may have changed into a different like i think we may be in a different s space now with the with the riots and with the, the these other kind of narratives that are now kind of going to war with each other like that feels yeah. like a significant shift from where we were before but i guess yeah. that yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah and I think I I've been you know slowly catching up on so it's been interesting to to watch myself try to make sense of how, of all this and who I turn towards right and it's primarily um Daniel Schmachtenberger Jordan Hall um Nora Bateson uh and the thing that I hear especially Jordan and Daniel warning about is you know daniel i think said only 1% of warfare is kinetic and just really seeing i think if there's one one thing coming out of retreat that became clear to me was just how much our way of seeing the world is colored by the information ecosystem we participate in like as soon as i went back in it was like i was in a different world I was just like all of a sudden poof I'm in a world of cultural warfare and um you know various kinds of mimetic conflicts and it's like that's not real it's really, I think it's really important that we both realize that that's not real and that we can periodically relieve ourselves from having to participate in it completely mm -hmm. uh I think one of the things that I was looking at on my retreat was that um, this, you know, one of the fundamental like laws of consciousness is what you attune to in your perception gets amplified, regardless of what it is, right? So if you, if you have pain in your leg and 
your attention just falls into that, your whole world can become pain. If you have pleasure or well-being arising in your body and you learn how to pay attention to that skillfully, your whole world can become pleasure and well-being. And so coming out of retreat, I just felt a lot more careful about what I allow to occupy my attention in terms of the world that it will then create for me that I will then, you know, spread to others in my network mm. and in my world. And so um, I, I appreciate Daniel in particular, his caution around just, just going, his, his, his invitation, just go slowly. Just don't collapse into a perspective yet. Mm. Like we are in a liminal space and it's appropriate to be liminal. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise, I think of all, yeah, Daniel has a real uncanny skill to be able to speak to. He's able to speak without activating anyone immune, anyone's immune system. Yeah. On which is, which is what I'm kind of realizing is actually the most, the most important thing Oh. is to not activate the immune system of either right or left Yeah, long enough that people can actually hear what you're trying to say rather than yeah. immediately collapse into, totally. oh, you said something about... <laughs> <laughs> like, this, this, is the, this is the primary thing, is that in every single area now, it's like, which side are you on? And yeah. people are not interested in, oh my God. in anything beyond that. It's just like, I'm waiting for you to signal which side you're on, whether that's, and there's yeah. so many topics and there's so the, many. Totally. This is why it was, it was so scary to talk to the New York Times coming out of retreat. Cause I had no, I, I knew that the cultural battlegrounds had shifted because of COVID and that there were things that I, you know, wasn't supposed to say and things that I like was supposed to say according to certain ideologies, but I had no idea what it was. Right. <laughs> and so I, I found myself being very, um, cautious in the way that I express myself. Uh, and it's like what you say, like I, even coming out, I noticed that I was like, and somebody would say something like, Oh, you know, the Republicans, they're not, they're trying to get us not to wear masks. And I was like, okay, great. So I now know that that is that ideological line is drawn there. Very good. <laughs> There's some continuity that makes sense. The Republicans would do that. And then some liberals believe that fi that COVID is caused by 5g. I'm just like, what? is happening here <laughs> what is even going on uh but you know yeah but but there are but there are paradoxes even within that which is on an, on a classic kind of big five personality republicans are more interested in sanctity like the fact that it actually has become a signifier of, on the right to not care about covid or to be more in favor of uh lifting lockdown is is interesting you wouldn't necessarily mm. have expected yeah. that but Actually, there's more um, hmm. there's more antipathy towards disease on the right than there is on the left. Like that's mm -hmm. that's one of the kind of signifiers. But it's mm -hmm. it's extraordinary. Like the whole thing is yeah. being shifted in in real time. Totally. Um, depending on what key figures say, mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, and so I, I find myself um, pretty ambivalent about about whether to and to what degree to try to piece it all together again. Hmm. Um, I, I imagine I wouldn't have felt that way if I had been there through the, the accelerating deconstruction reconstruction. Like if I had been participating in it, I probably would have felt more like included or something, but I just, I can't, there's a part of me that can't find a reason to care too much about it. That sounds healthy. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I wonder, I don't know. It's an open question for me. Yeah. I mean, I guess the other question is how, how was the retreat? Like 75 days. Yeah. <laughs> it was a solo, solo retreat with meditation and. Yeah. I mean, it's funny how nobody asked me about how the retreat went. <laughs> you're, you're one of the first people um, outside of my community here, obviously. Um, yeah, so it was 75 days. Uh, I was in silence in a cabin on the land here at the Monastic Academy. The cabin has no electricity, no running water, just propane heating. 
Um, and it's pretty small, you know, enough space for a bed, a meditation cushion and like a yoga mat basically. Um, and I went in when the snow was, you know, up to my waist just about here in Northern Vermont. And I came out in, you know, beautiful spring day. Uh, and, uh, in that, during, in those 75 days, it's pretty simple. You know, it's not that exciting. It's kind of like a very boring version of the movie Groundhog Day. I just got up, meditated for two hours. Maybe had some tea, meditated for two hours, went for a walk, meditated for two hours, had lunch, went for a longer walk, meditated for two hours, met with a teacher for five or 10 minutes, meditate for two hours, go to sleep with exercise and, you know, crying and laughing and connecting with the birds between all that interspersed in there. Yeah. So it's pretty, pretty simple. And how was your inner experience during it? Uh, well, so I, it was definitely the best experience I've had in my life. I would say that, you know, without a doubt. It was the most, well, I can't even really say why it was the best experience of my life. But I, I, I know that it was. Um, the inner experience, you know, if you've ever done any kind of retreat like this, it contained everything, the whole spectrum of the, what the human being, I think, is capable of experiencing in, in intense grief. Um unbelievable joy, uh, you know, boredom kind of, uh, love, hatred, self-hatred, uh, freedom, tons of suffering. 75 days is a long time. Mm. So you can pack a lot in there. Um, and I was mostly exploring, uh, this kind of meditation called the jhanas, like exploring the jhanas, which are states of basically altered states of states of consciousness in the Buddhist tradition, um, which I could explore more with you if, if that's interesting. Um, and then spent a lot of time uh, exploring the soul making dharma, which I've uh, talked about with the creator of it, Rob Bay, on my show. Uh, Rob Bay actually just passed away while I was on retreat, um, and. So yeah, that's what I spent most of my time doing. And of course, inevitably you think about things and you deal with what comes up and it's, it's an incredibly rich experience. Um, and it's also kind of ineffable. I imagine in the same way that a lot of folks experience of quarantine and lockdown is, you know, you can kind of say like what it is that you did, but the, the psychic territory that you move through is so intimate that you really can't talk about it, at least not adequately. Um, and so I, I, and so, yeah, it was like that. It's like that. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, you also managed somehow to get COVID while you were. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. How did you manage that? So it, uh, one of the people who came to the last retreat before we kind of were going to, we, we locked down the center where the center was locked down. Uh, I think they came from Boston and this was, you know, early March. So before shit had really hit the fan, I think, um, they brought it and it just spread like nothing I've ever seen around this community. Um, I think almost everybody got it. And then about a week and a half or two weeks later, I got it somehow. Yeah. It was cool. I could, I could, because I was meditating, I could watch it like from, from birth to death very closely uh, mm. and see what it did to my body and also see what my mind tried to do with it. Hmm. At, at the end of this process, have you got any insight or thoughts into what you want to do with emerge? Um, you feeling called to to make any more podcasts or any more conversations? I, I will definitely have more podcasts, more conversations. I think um, I need to sync up a little bit with the collective before I start deciding what that's going to look like. But where I'm feeling drawn right now is into actually like longer form 
and rarer conversations. So doing like really deep dives with folks um, about particular topics. And so getting, <laughs> getting even more esoteric, <laughs> perhaps. Um, but that just feels like that's where I'm, I'm drawn. And um, especially with the emergence of like the STOA, I think that that is doing a lot of the work that I originally set out to do with Emerge. And so it's, and with Rebel Wisdom, you know, I'm just like, it's great when friends come and sort of like take care of parts of the picture so that, you know, you can just step back and do the thing that's uniquely yours. And, um, so I think something like the, the more, more deep dives, longer form is maybe what's uniquely mine. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have a thought of topics, subjects, or people? Hmm. Uh, I have some thoughts, but I haven't, I haven't sorted it all out yet. Uh, I'm definitely going to do a, a long series with Zach Stein. He, he lives nearby and we've been spending time together. And I think there's a lot that he has to share that hasn't yet made it onto podcasts or media appearances that he's made. So that's certainly going to happen. Um, don't know beyond that. Yeah. Mm. And what's been the most surprising thing since you've come out? Um, I think like, uh, how much easier it is for me to love the people I'm around. Yeah. I think both because of COVID maybe, but also because of my practice, like a lot of the ways that I've kept myself from caring about and loving the people that are just here in this community have fallen away. And it feels just really effortless to love them. And it's wonderful. Um, and I was surprised because usually when you kind of like feel all lovey when you come off a retreat, that fades pretty quick, you know, because people are complicated. <laughs> but it's it's uh, stuck around so far. So I'm really surprised about that. Hmm. So you're still in the honeymoon period after the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, it doesn't feel like it. It feels like I got like just thrown back out into the wilds, you know, with um, hmm. just the my life after... The retreat uh and that's partly why i'm surprised that this part has maintained um, mm. is because i actually have like lost my shit in a lot of respects pretty quickly after the retreat that feel, felt like a good um point to close to me great yeah well, thank you david it's been, a, it's been a pleasure to speak with you yeah you too daniel it's been yeah really good to yeah hear what you have come back with and the, yeah, the insight, not only the insight that you got from, from the, the, the retreat, but also the insight that I feel that it's given you into the kind of the, the dynamics of the media and the dynamics of sort of the system that you're reentering. Mm. Like that, I think, is really, really fascinating as well. Um, and maybe, maybe you're able to see it more clearly because you've sort of cleaned your mind, cleared your mind a little bit on the, on the retreat. So therefore, coming out, there's more of a, like, handbrake turn of whoa what, what? <laughs> yeah and it's also help helps to speak with somebody like yourself i think you you've you've n many of what I, much of what i've said I, I i did not know i knew until you asked the question so mm. appreciate you um calling it forth that's that's uh, a real conversation mm. rebel wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media it was built for these times of crisis and change which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.